Hi all. This is one of my most um, dramatic games from the Barnet Congress where I was white against FM Dave Ledger. I think this was in round four on the second day on Sunday. So I kicked off with Knight F3, which I've beaten him once before with at South End. So I'm avoiding uh, quite a bit of opening theory. Uh, he just plays for a King's Indian type setup. So I continue without committing my D pawn just yet. So I just fear and chateau my bishop. And now he plays c6. And I'm wondering here for a while, um, you know, do I play d4 and that's just King's Indian fear and chateau variation? Where c6 is often sort of handy. Uh, for example, you know, bishop g4, h3, the bishop could go back uh, to attack the c pawn. And if d5, then c takes. That reminds me of fear and chateau variation. So I wanted something slightly different. I played h3 to try and restrict black's counterplay. And I was a bit surprised by my opponent's next move. Dave played queen a5, as if he might be playing queen h5. So I was a bit concerned by this, and I started looking at a few variations, but decided actually that would be too dangerous for him because of g4 in principle. Um, he played actually, um, I played e4 then, not not too concerned about queen h5. And he played actually e5. Let's have a quick look if he had played queen h5. I think this would have been good, e5. Well, this, this is my thoughts at the time. It might not be the best. But the idea here is, with, with the pawn sack e5, I get access to knight e4 now. And then knight g3, I should be able to evict his queen. Um, so anyway, he didn't he didn't play for queen h5. He actually just played e5. Now played d3. So it's a sort of Botvinnik system, but the knight's usually on e2 in the Botvinnik system to support f4 more uh, uh, quickly. So he played a6, another bit of a surprising move, because I thought I could simply gain a tempo attacking his queen indirectly with, with, with that constant threat of knight d5. And at the same time, try and get rid of his you know, dark squared bishop, which I know is a bit of a crude idea, but it's often quite effective to get rid of that bishop. I think Asparov once said it's a sin to give up the king's Indian bishop that, you know, that easily. But um, here, in effect, I'm, I'm arranging to swap it off, and he doesn't even play rook e8 to, to allow bishop h8. He just, he just goes with it, the flow, and just plays a5. And I note now that, well, okay, I'll, I'll go for that bishop then, um, but here, I'm a bit more concerned. Well, I'm looking at queen g5 as well and queen h4, but I'm thinking that knight c5 attacks d3. And then the knight could go to e6, and that would be a good square. So um, I, ch I changed to be slightly more positional now after with this move, queen e3, which also I thought was stopping knight c5 for the reason I'm about to show you. The knight c5... I just play knight takes e5. So it's a bit of a little tactic. So if takes queen c5, and this actually happened. And after the game, he just he just confessed that it was a uh, blunder. So I'm a pawn up here. And I thought, this is this is getting quite interesting. This is an interesting advantage now, solid pawn up. But uh, I've got this backward pawn on the same and default. So at the time of the game, I was thinking, well, may maybe it was just um, a subtle positional sack just to get a bit of pressure. But now I noticed an interesting move. Knight d5, just exploiting that pin on c6. So all of a sudden, I think I'm building an advantage out of nothing. He plays queen d6. And again, I find what I think is a really interesting continuation. But although there's a very good idea with what I played in this position, I, I, t I take on d6. Um, the idea is that I can potentially um, you know, get a pawn to e5 to, to fork these guys. But... I think I should have been looking for a bit more spice to the idea. I played the idea with the D pawn. Now, if I had just calmed down a bit, I could still play the idea, but with the F pawn. And apparently this is more effective, checking with, with Ribica, just playing F4 here. So letting the knight go just for that F takes E. And this this would be a bit dire for, for black. Sorry, sorry, not, not, not C takes D there. Knight, knight takes would... Um, probably have to be played, and um, and and this starts to be a dire uh, position for Black. You know, Rook A E one, and I'm I'm massive advantage here. But so I play a slightly 
less effective continuation, but still pretty good. D4. It does solve the backward pawn issue, and I'm thinking that you know this this looks visually so impressive now, but I do give him rook b6, unfortunately, and he's getting my b pawn. Uh, so the game continues with me apparently having a crushing advantage now. I really felt it was crushing these these pawns in the centre. But on the other hand, he's got an active rook. And with the active rook, he can win the a-pawn. And with the a-pawn, this rook would be kind of automatically being developed with every step of this a-pawn. So maybe this isn't as brilliant as it seems. So some precise play is needed. Uh, but I still go for trying to promote my d-pawn in the long term, as a long term plan. But first I want to try and get the rooks off, but he refuses. Now I start to advance this d pawn in slow steps uh, with f4 preparing the first idea of e5 and d6. So he plays a4 and because I'm concerned about this a pawn potentially being a source of counterplay, uh, I thought at the time this was a good move because it's fixing the pawn on the light square as well. He plays king e7 and now I start advancing the center pawns. And it's here where you know, it's reaching dramatic proportions. Surely black hasn't, you know, got much of a game here. And, um, but it's all of a sudden it's not looking too easy. I can't really see anything totally concrete here. How to blast my way with the d-pawn. So I play rook d1 anyway. And now I, I decide, well, I can sack, surely I can sack a3 to try and get the rook to the 7th which looks good in principle, to start attacking his pawns. And then, you know, if I win f7, it will be a disaster for him. So I was fairly optimistic here. But now, after rook c7, he just simply plays bishop e6. And I'm starting to feel, am I blowing this? Uh, so bishop e6 says, yeah, why not? Just, just protect f7. Where's the rook going? Um, and if I take on b7... Then you know maybe um, just rook takes g3 is annoying. So I play another good move, which turns out according to Rubicut to be still quite a good move. And it's here that after rook takes a3, I, I get excited with another brilliancy. But again, there's another way of adding a bit of spice to brilliancy, which I miss. Um, I realise I can simply push my d pawn here. Because the king can't now take on c7 because of d8 queening. And I thought, oh my, you know, what is he going to do here? So I excitedly play that. But um, if I had calmly worked out a defensive resource, namely to stop the d-pawn with the, virtually the only move, rook a8, then the preliminary move, bishop b7, must be seen as, as much stronger than d7 here. In fact, this idea, bishop takes b7, with the idea of d7, seems fairly crushing. Um, unfortunately, I didn't play that. I, I played d7. So he plays rook a8. And again, um, well, I thought this is a slightly different position now, because surely I take on b3, I'm attacking his rook. Has, has he miscalculated this? So I take on b7, he plays rook b3. I'm running a bit short of time, and I quickly take on b3. And to my horror, he just plays bishop takes b3, and I'm, of course, attacking my rook on d1. And I'm thinking, I've totally blown this game from what was a visually crushing advantage to seemingly an almost insignificant a-pawn or an active rook, which could have been all avoided with f4 instead of d4. Uh, so the active rook got the b, uh, you know, got b2 and then a2. It's done a lot of damage, that rook, and it didn't even need to come into my position. And I'm, I'm really blowing it. So now I was kind of getting depressed and thinking it was actually kind of a losing position, because my rook is going to be trapped now with the bishop and the pawn on a2. So this is pretty diabolical. So at some point here, in a depressed state, after a draw, and of course it's refused, um, he just plays on, of course, and so a2, trapping my rook. Um, I don't know why, I, I thought, well, I must play on to give a bit of a fight, so I, I play h4. Actually, one thought comes to mind about trying to remove all the pawns and then coming back over here. But it was fairly optimistic stuff. This this is a, technically a, a dreadful position, a, a lost position. H5, and now he plays G takes, and all of a sudden I'm thinking, 
well if g takes then h6 and i've got nothing but what about g5 and try and get h7 because then on h7 the bishop could come back here and maybe you know this would actually be a tactical vulnerability especially if g6 can be used to try and wrench open this pawn so it's a really obscure kind of tactical idea going on here so i play g5 he plays h4 and i take on h7 and now the obscure idea is seeing the light of day that all of a sudden g6 bishop g8 taking on b3 is is all of a sudden maybe on the cards and what i've done although it seemed co completely ridiculous to invite a second past outside pawn with the bishop on d5 potentially supporting both of these outside past pawns this is a ludicrous idea in principle what i've just done but in this position